Good morning, class. Here we are again, getting ready to uh, head into another exciting lecture on uh, mm -hmm. ME4220. I hope you guys are doing well, staying safe, and uh, are enjoying this uh, change of venue. I don't know. It's, uh, it's a little bit different. Okay, um, this is where I left off uh, on the uh, previously recorded lecture. Um, so we'll start here, go to presentation mode. There we go. Okay, <clears throat> so this is looking at a, a graph, which is a pump curve, the top curve. And I use my uh, cursor here. I don't know if you can see this in the video. I kind of think you can't, but this top curve uh, represents the pump from the pump manufacturer. The bottom curve, which sweeps up from uh, zero, zero, uh, kind of the parabolic looking curve, is the system curve. And so that represents the piping pressure drop uh, as a function of flow. And you can see it's, uh, it's roughly a second order curve, uh, something like that. And as the GPM goes up, the, and that's the frictional loss uh, to push the water through the pipes and the fittings and all of that. So really that's everything in the system except the control valve. Um, you can draw that uh, system curve to include the control valve and have just one smooth curve. Uh, in this uh, diagram, they come up to the end of this curve at our design um, flow and then we show just a straight line up to the pump curve, and that's the, uh, the pressure drop across that control valve when it's wide open and the pump is delivering design flow to the system. And so the big dot, the design condition dot, is the operating point on the curve. <clears throat> so it's also possible to draw just one system curve that doesn't have this kind of discontinuity at the end, where you include the pressure drop of the control valve with the rest of the piping and the other components, in which case then you just have a, a parabolic curve that goes from the design point down to the origin. And going through the origin down here at zero, zero indicates there's no static head or no static lift in the system as we might have, say, with a cooling tower. Okay, well, so if you were throttling this system, say we don't need design flow, maybe we need 50% of design flow, you get back to this intermediate point, and we see at the lower flow rate, the uh, pressure drop of the piping has uh, diminished significantly, okay? So it's actually a factor of four if this is all because um, the pressure drop squares is, uh, falls as the square of the velocity, and if the velocity, if the flow is 50%, the velocity is 50%. So this, this, this down to the system curve at the reduced GPM over on the uh, vertical axis, the feet of head would basically be one fourth of at the design flow. At any rate, then you have the long arrow that gets you up to the pump curve because that's where you have to operate is on the pump curve. And so we see that, my goodness, that control valve has a huge pressure drop across it. And that represents lost energy. Uh, that, uh, that's pump energy that's just being dropped in order to reduce the flow rate. That's why a, a variable speed uh, situation is much more efficient. And now to illustrate that, I'm gonna get out of this presentation and go to a presentation I actually use in 4260, but these courses all kind of overlap a little bit. <clears throat> so uh, there's, I know we've got a lot going on on this, but this is a uh, uh, condenser tower, or cooling tower pump. Uh, it is number two at some plant that I went to. But basically what we're showing here is we have, um, an operating point, measured operating point up here at the top of the curve, which is at roughly, what is that? Looks about, looks like about 116 feet of head. And uh, the flow rate is, what is that? Uh, that's about 18, looks like a little short of 1800 GPM, maybe 1780, 1790. 
something like that, okay? And so this is where we're operating. And, and this is with uh, throttled valves or, you know, control valves. And we see that if we were to open the valve and slow the pump down to roughly, and these curves shifted a little bit in copying, but if we, if we could slow the pump from, uh, say, 1750, 1780, whatever RPM down to about uh, 1290 RPM, we could operate down here on the system curve and produce, oh, I don't know, what is it, 50 something feet of head, uh, which would be far less pump energy. So that's kind of what the uh, variable speed pumping is all about. And we don't do a whole lot of that in this course. We do quite a bit of it in the, uh, the 4260 class. So let me go back to this now and get fired up here. Okay. Um, so that's kind of the explanation of this slide. Okay, so uh, still under control valve operation. Uh, as differential pressure applied to a given valve increases, more and more flow is forced through the valve at the same position. So in other words, uh, this would be kind of like a laboratory setting or something. But if you took a valve and you put it, whatever position it was in, could be 100%, could be 50%. As I apply more pressure, upstream pressure, I'm going to push more flow through the valve. So that's what the first point is, is saying. That's, I think, uh, fairly obvious. Uh, this may result in unbalanced heat transfer condition at the unit. Now, what happens in the system, and we'll see, is if we have a bunch of these control valves, as some of them start shutting, that's going to up the pressure in the distribution piping, and that can then force more flow through uh, a different coil than the one that, say, its control valve didn't change, but its neighbors changed which up the pressure, which then forces more water through that one. And so that causes an upset in the system because you get more uh, heat delivered to the space when you really weren't calling for it. So as this happens, differential pressure increases once more. So, so then that, that, that room's valve starts to shut because it starts overheating. That ups the pressure again, and this cascades through the system. Um, so for this uh, reason, the designer should select terminal unit control valves at a relatively high initial pressure drop. And so what that says <clears throat> is that we already have, even when the valve is wide open, because the valve may be downsized a little bit, it has a significant pressure drop. And so when the next door neighbor valve closes and the pressure goes up, it doesn't upset the system as much because it already has a fairly significant pressure drop across it. So that will limit the ratio of the pressure difference increase that can occur. Okay, so a lot of, a lot of words and all, so you need to think through this. Uh, this last bullet is something that you need to write down and remember. Accepted initial pressure drops for smaller systems are 25% of the total pump head with a minimum of 10 feet. So that is a criteria for selecting uh, control valves. And as we get toward the end of this presentation, we'll have a bunch of example systems where you'll actually be able to go out and select some particular control valves. But you need to remember that last bullet point. Uh, larger systems may be designed with initial control valve pressure drops equal to the pressure drop from the terminal unit circuit. Uh, and that would be the total of the coil plus the runouts and fittings. So that would be from the distribution header, all the fittings through the coil and back to the return distribution pipe. So that's for larger systems. This rule is aimed at terminal unit controls and not necessarily at equipment room control valves. Okay, so this is at the terminal unit where we're actually conditioning the space. Now, in the, in the, the mechanical room where we will have valves to uh, control the amount of uh, chill water that's pumped or to distribute it out, we want to minimize the pressure drop on those valves. So control valves located in the equipment room uh, to supply varying water temperatures to the system or to govern hot chill water 
uh, flow should generally be selected at low 10 foot or less pressure drops. So, you know, this third bullet is in reference to design in a mechanical room, and the first bullet is at the terminal unit, which is actually conditioning the space. Big difference between those two. This will reduce the overall pump head and permit the pump to aid in establishing design water flow rates at the terminal unit. So just another comment on the fourth bullet is a comment on the third bullet. Okay, so let's get on and look at a two-way valve application. So a two-way valve means that all this valve can do is close off against the flow. Uh, if it's strong enough and can resist the pump head, it can close completely off and kill the flow in that particular line. Uh, so these can be either modulating, which means they can respond to a thermostat and just modulate smoothly from complete open to complete closed and back and forth based on the set point and the desired temperature in the space. Or they can be two position valves, which either uh, snap open and you get full flow or they snap shut and you get no flow. And, that, and then the space temperature would have some sort of a, a band from you know, a high, uh, the, the high end of the band when the, the temperature got to that point, it would shut the valve completely off so you got no heat and then it would let the temperature drift down to the lower end of the control valve, at which point the valve would open. Um, and uh, you would get full flow through the coil. So that's uh, modulating versus two position. Valve operation is governed by a space thermostat or an airstream sensor. Some kind of a sensor is gonna determine whether we need flow or not, or how much flow through uh, a coil. Okay, while this basic arrangement may prove suitable for small systems employing a limited number of units, it has, uh, it has some problems or drawbacks as system size increases. And so you can see here, this is a uh, uh, two-way control valves on a direct return system because the, that first zone uh, has very short supply and return piping. The zone on the far right has long supply piping and long return piping. So it's definitely direct uh, return. Okay, so as some valves go to the shutoff position, more and more, because that's gonna up the uh, pressure drop uh, or, or the pressure in the supply line, you know, it's gonna back you up the pump curve a little bit. And so the valves that are open, uh, it's gonna force more water through those valves and then they're gonna react. So this can lead to heat transfer imbalance, uh, could lead to noise from high velocity through the valves. So there are some solutions to this. Um, we can only have <laughs> a minimum number of units in the design, but you have to design for the whole building, whatever it is. So that may not be real <laughs> uh, practical. Uh, we can employ zone pumping, which this uh, picture below shows that we've got zone one and zone two. So instead of having four units on one pump, you've got two units on uh, one pump and two units on another pump, which I guess will help some. Or today we would probably employ variable speed pumping, which then you would set a particular uh, pressure difference between the supply and the return uh, mains and simply the pump would modulate speed to maintain that, which is a big uh, benefit and a big improvement. So that's the, these days, that's the direction you would want to go with this. Okay, and so this is uh, illustrating more on the variable speed pump. So we can see that uh, we have a pressure uh, transducer uh, at B and a pressure transducer at C, and the B is at the supply header and the C uh, is at the return. And so we simply have a set point to maintain whatever differential pressure we need to force flow through the terminal units, and we maintain that uh, by modulating the pump speed. So that works very, very nicely. So that's, uh, that would be a recommended condition. And, to, and it also, it works well, and it minimizes, reduces pump energy. So that's pretty good. 
Uh, this goes back to the zone pumping. I kind of talked through this before. Uh, this uh, can reduce the number of zones uh, on a particular pump. That can be a small pump, and so uh, that can help. Um, that's especially true of direct return uh, because that the zone two units have longer supply and return. The zone one units are both fairly short, so that helps in that regard as well. And of course, we if we get our pressure drop correct on our uh, control valves, this will aid in minimizing the uh, the balance and imbalance problem. Okay, so these are some issues. We'll go through. I think there's four of them that'll be discussed here. The first. Uh, would be that comes up with this. Uh, some designers will sometimes put in a differential pressure bypass valve. This would be for a constant speed pump. And so this slide shows up uh, along the boiler. Um, you maintain, you monitor the differential pressure and if it gets too high that valve opens and basically it just lets some flow recirculate. It gives an open flow path if the other four valves are closed or almost closed. Uh, and so the author of, of this, Bell and Gossett's not a big fan of this. Um, so basically what it does is it flattens out, effectively it flattens out the pump curve as we'll see on the next slide. So we see if you had kind of screwed up and had a steep pump curve put in that bypass, uh, effectively changes the shape of the uh, pump curve. Why not actually, but as that bypass starts opening, then you just can't build uh, a lot of pressure. Uh, yeah, even as the flow rate going out to the system, uh, just uh, uh, it, it bypasses and relieves the pressure. So that would uh, be wasteful of energy, but it would uh, certainly uh, work to keep from overpressurizing the system. Okay, another issue that comes up with these two-way control valves would be, are they strong enough to shut off against the uh, pump head? And that's a good question, because uh, if not, then as some of the neighboring valves start closing off, it's gonna drive up system pressure and if the valves aren't strong enough to shut, then you're gonna be forcing hot, say if this is a heating situation, hot water through a valve that's trying to close, but it's not strong enough. And so that would cause major, major problems in the operation of the system. So you gotta make sure that the valves uh, are strong enough to uh, close off against the maximum, more than the maximum pressure that the pump could ever deliver to them so that you maintain controllability. Okay, well, what about freeze? We're always, when you have a coil, uh, we're always concerned about freezing the coil and the coil or a pipe up around the coil bursting, flooding the unit. That's just a bad day all over the place for everybody. So if you have a situation where we're gonna use a shutoff valve on a coil, then, you, that, then there's no flow through the coil and then a, a dead coil is much more likely to freeze than one that has some kind of flow through it. So the free, freeze up possibility is created or really enhanced. So we, we don't recommend uh, for a water system that, that the, the unit be able to completely shut off flow if the, uh, there's outside air, ventilation air that's coming into that unit because the outside air is the cold source that could potentially freeze the coil a damper sticks open because you know this stuff all malfunctions from time to time and so if you if you have a stagnant coil a damper is supposed to shut it doesn't then go after an hour or two you freeze the coil it pops and you got a big mess on your hands <clears throat> uh, single water temperature available okay so uh a lot of simple systems or ones by designed by designers that don't really know what they're doing uh, may let's say on a heating side may design a constant water supply temperature of 160 180 degrees well 
what happens is that it's hard to control the amount of uh, heat transfer from that coil, especially as you, uh, the, your valves start trying to shut. And so if you don't have the right type of valve as illustrated below, but a quick opening linear or equal percentage, um, you can lose controllability. So um, you can do a couple things. You can do, uh, you can reset boiler water temperature with outside air is probably the best thing to do. And certainly selecting the right style of control valves to make your control system work properly is important as well. So <clears throat> this, uh, I just added this slide today, but it just illustrates what I uh, reset hot water temperature with outside air uh, schedule. This is the kind of thing that uh, engineers put on plans. And so you can see uh, at um, uh, 40 degrees outside, we're scheduled for 140 degree uh, heating water temperature. And as it gets colder, we simply ramp that up. Yeah, these are typically linear, pretty close to linear. And so we're showing it at zero, it's going to 180 degrees. Uh, the engineer can select whatever schedule he wants. Uh, you could take it to, uh, 180 at 10 degrees if you wanted to and then just maintain it there as it gets colder if that's sufficient heat to heat your building and we show it at greater than 50 so sometimes you need hot water for reheat purposes sometimes for dehumidification uh, you will cool the air colder than it needs to just to maintain the space in order to wring the moisture out and then you have to heat it back up again so even in the summer months uh, for some types of systems, we need what we call reheat water. And so you might just keep that set on 140. You might take it down to 120, something like that. It's up to the engineer. But that's what a, uh, a reset uh, schedule looks like or a curve looks like for resetting hot water heating uh, temperature uh, with outside air. <coughs> Okay, so freeze protection and pump protection. So it's possible if these are two position valves that they might, it, they could all close at one time, which would deadhead the pump. Well, that could be a problem. So sometimes this bypass will go out at the far end of the system and put a little bypass line uh, just to allow a flow path. Uh, if for chance all of the control valves were to close at one time. Uh, dead head on a large pump will damage it. If it's a real small pump, it probably wouldn't uh, hurt it much. But um, yeah, and that, <coughs> that valve bypass, <coughs> excuse me, uh, that, that valve could stay shut and you could have a pressure sensor on it that if the pump head you know, if all these other valves are closing and the pressure goes up to a certain point, then that valve opens so that you don't just push uh, water around that, that loop uh, all the time when it doesn't, when it's not serving a purpose. So anyway, that's a possibility. Okay, now we can move on to three-way, uh, two-position control valves. So a three-way valve can modulate just like the two-way valve can, or it can be, it can just snap back and forth. So the, the first couple slides here are two position three-way valves, which means that you either get full flow through the coil or full flow through the bypass. Um, so that's about it. That's probably under thermostat control. When the space is satisfied, bingo. Uh, you, you, you switch to the bypass and the pump never knows the difference here because you set up the bypass to have the same pressure drop as the coil. And so back and forth, uh, the, the pump doesn't know <coughs> where the water's going. Okay, so more on that. Pump will not sense any change in system pressure drop, nor will it change the system flow provided the bypass balance valve is adjusted to simulate the coil pressure drop. So that little uh, on the bypass lines, if you can see my arrow, um, these bypass, these little carrots, these little uh, 
uh, carrots uh, on the bypass line. Uh, that's adjustable and the balance people set it up to uh, maintain the same pressure drop as the coils. So the, the pump doesn't see any change as these things switch from coil flow to bypass flow. Um, so you can't deadhead the pump and you, you don't get any better control uh, or system flexibility, but you do uh, protect the pump, even though you're probably wasting because you're pumping the same flow all of the time, uh, which is more than you need, uh, except at uh, you know, design conditions. Okay, uh, some comments on uh, three-way valves, two-position control. These are disadvantages. Uh, when the valves go to bypass, we stagnate the flow in the coil. And again, we have, uh, if we have any outside air available, we have freeze up potential. Uh, and that covers the second bullet point as well. Uh, number two, only a single water temperature is available uh, to the units. If that's the case, then that's a disadvantage. But again, you could do on a heating system, you could do boiler water reset. Uh, chill water systems don't typically reset very much, maybe a little bit in really mild or, or uh, dry weather, but not as much as the hot water systems do. Um, let's see, uh, number three, the system may require substantial balancing, particularly if the unit design pressure drops vary. So again, we may have balancing issues. Uh, a two pipe direct return distribution system will hinder system balance and should be avoided. So by two pipe, it means that um, I have to use the same pipes for heating or cooling. So in the summertime, I simply pump chill water through that piping system. And in the wintertime, I pump hot water. A four pipe system would have separate pipes for hot water and chill water and two separate coils in each unit. So a, a comment on two pipe direct return, which is what I'm showing right here. Okay, so the three-way two position control valves, it's conducive to good pump operation. We've said that because the pump doesn't know if it's set up correctly. So stable pump operation helps the uh, control valves and the actual level of control is identical to that of the two-way valves because that's either full flow or no flow whether you do it uh, with two valves or however many valves that uh, you got. Okay, uh, okay, let's go on to three-way modulating control valves. Uh, let's see here. So these have, each valve has a really an infinite number of positions between full open to the coil to full flows to the flow, to fully closed flow to the coil and that's under the control of the thermostat. Um, increases design flexibility uh, as you get these varying flow rates. Um, but it, Sometimes this, the advantages may not be as significant as you may first think because there is some inherent uh, instability and imbalance as we'll illustrate on the next slide with a modulating three-way valve. <clears throat> so what this is gonna show, it yeah, shows just one, obviously one coil, one unit, but let's say that the design pressure drop was 20 feet at 100 GPM. Well, say that valve modulates and we're gonna get half of the flow through the coil and half of the flow through the bypass, which means you have half of the velocity through the coil and half of the velocity through the bypass, which means you have 25% of the pressure drop. So now that whole circuit from supply main to return main only has uh, five feet where at full flow, either through the bypass or coil, it has 20 feet that as that valve modulates, that pressure difference is gonna cause upset in the system and potentially upset other coils and other zones that are on the system as well. So 
you know, and we show down at the bottom the note, the bypass valve must be adjusted to provide 20 foot pressure drop at full bypass flow. So that makes it simulate the core. Uh, has the same flow drop, pressure drop characteristics as the core. So this is an issue. So even though the bypass uh, may be balanced to simulate the coil pressure drop uh, at the full bypass condition, at a, a load calling for 50% through the coil, 50% through the bypass will reduce the pressure drop to 25% of its original value. This in turn will cause the constant speed pump to increase total system flow and upset a stabilized condition. And so as the number of units on the system increases, problems magnified. Now, again, with variable speed pumping, uh, you can alleviate this. Um, so that's probably what would happen. So these days, um, it, since as if a lot of corals go to the 50% position, instead of uh, changing the flow in the header, we can simply adjust the speed of the pump and mitigate this. So we've now we've got our three-way modulating control valves, our disadvantages. Um, it could be that we only have a single water temperature available. Um, so we would need to look at uh, boiler water reset. Uh, it would probably be the, the, the solution to that. Uh, control can be unstable. And we talked about that based on those pressure drops. Uh, so getting the control valve selection uh, with a significant pressure drop across that coil is important. The um, distribution main, um, Terminal unit pressure drop relationship should be calculated as we, we talked about that above. Uh, uh, again, if we go to full bypass through uh, the, the coil uh, or bypassing the coil, the coil is stagnant. And again, we have freeze up potential. Um, system balance can be a problem. Um, and complete balance can never be achieved because pressure drops the unit very continually as unit blow as unit load varies uh, and balance in one unit will affect the other units. So there's issues. <clears throat> um, this is uh, another one would be uh, shifting pump operating or operational points may lead to motor overload. Okay, and we can get around that if we purchased a non-overloading uh, motor uh, on the pump when we selected the pump. And so uh, this is actually, uh, this is the pump curve for Brown Hall. Uh, I think it's chill water. It's been a while since we worked on that. Um, the, uh, the, the, this is the fam really a family of pump curves. Uh, that's a Bell and Gossett uh, uh, pump curve. Um, so we see the top black curve has a over on the left hand side says 13 and a half inches. That's the impeller diameter. That's the maximum uh, diameter that can go in that particular pump uh, casing. The minimum is 10 and for our selection at 310 GPM at 160 feet ahead, um, they selected a 12.875 inch impeller. So that 13 and a half inch impeller was simply trimmed to 12.875 <coughs> inches. Now this non-overloading motor, you can see, um, you see the 15, 20, 25, and 30 horsepower curves. Those are lines of constant horsepower that are required by the pump at different uh, flow and head uh, conditions. So just as an example, uh, let's say at 300, if we were selecting this for 300 and we selected it for 310, but at 300, uh, to be on the 12.875 uh, the inch impeller curve, we're going to be uh, about 17 and a half, a little over 17 and a half horsepower. Okay, well, that says, well, gosh, I, a 20 horsepower pump would be just fine for that. But what if something happens, the valves get opened? 
and this pump starts operating out at the end of its pump curve, while it could it can it could push like 640 GPM, and that would be about 28 horsepower. So if we had spec a 20 uh, a 20 horsepower motor, we would burn it up. And so if we had spec a 25 horsepower motor with a 15% service factor, which is common on this type of motors, that um, we would be just fine. So when you select a motor for a pump, don't necessarily look at your particular service point, look at the end of the curve out here because things happen and you don't want to burn up a motor because something breaks or somebody opens a valve they're not supposed to open and we over pump the system. So that's kind of the story on the non-overloading pump selection. Okay, so to summarize uh, control valves, while the valve alone does not represent the ultimate in unit control, it has and can serve effectively uh, provided the design engineer recognizes inherent limitation and takes appropriate action to minimize the effects of these limitations. So the following points should be uh, kept in mind. Uh, calculate real pressure drops, use accurate charts and data, don't just use the rules of thumb and safety factor. Uh, we want flat pump curves, especially if it's gonna be a constant uh, speed pump and we want to select uh, to the center or left center of the pump curve. Um, correctly select terminal unit control valves at a high initial pressure drop. Uh, we had some guidelines on that. Select the terminal units and design the piping to obtain the maximum inherent balance. So it may well be uh, reverse return is gonna be better. It just depends on your system use reset water temperature control wherever possible. So that would probably be part of your boiler selection, uh, potentially your chiller selection as well. You get an automatic reset on that. And use primary secondary pumping techniques wherever possible. Uh, we will spend the next big module we go into in this course will be primary secondary. So I will reserve comments to when we get there. Okay, so we're getting towards the end of this. Uh, we got one more lecture to go. I'll break this up into smaller bites to make it a little more palatable for you. And so there's, we've got three examples that we go through uh, depth and detail. So that, that'll be coming in another day or two. So that's it for now. So I uh, hope you guys are doing good. And uh, like I said, I owe you a homework assignment. Uh, I'll get out shortly here. So bye-bye for now.